you go before I know that you've even gone to win my war and you come back with the head of my enemy you come back and you call it my victory You go before I know That you've even gone to win my war Your love becomes my greatest defense It leads me from the dry wilderness And all I do was pray And hallelujah, you have saved me so much better your way. Hallelujah, great defender, so much better your way. And hallelujah, you have saved me. So much better your way. Hallelujah, great defender. So much better this way. thought I lost me you knew where I left me you reintroduced me to your love and you picked up all my pieces put me back together you are the defender of my heart
save me so much better your way hallelujah great defender so much better your way and all i do was pray did was worship and all I did was bow down and all I did was stay still my mother's womb you formed me with your hands known and loved by you before I took a breath when I doubted Lord remind me I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. There's a healing light Just beyond the clouds Though I've walked through fire I see clearly now And I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake You're an artist and a potter On the canvas and the clay Work together. 
not finished with me You're not finished with me yet You're not finished with me You're not finished with me yet You're not finished with me You're not finished with me yet You're not finished with me You're not finished with me yet And you make all things Work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for your name. Good morning, friends. So good to see you again today. Welcome on this beautiful October morning. I want to remind you of who we are in Christ and what we believe as a church. We believe three things. We believe that there is hope beyond our brokenness. That your story and my story, it starts with being lost and it always ends with being found. Everything that you're going to hear this morning ends with a message of hope, and we need that during this time. Second, we're called to trust in our risen Savior, and Jesus is alive. Oh my gosh, Jesus is doing such incredible things right now in the lives of so many different people within our congregation. I just keep on hearing story after story after story. Um, so our, our call... Uh, the, our purpose, our, our, our work as the body of Christ is to trust Jesus. And he's alive and he's talking and he's moving. And our whole staff is designed and exists to help you trust Jesus more. It would be our great delight to help you. Finally, we are called to bring restoration to our community. And oh my gosh, you guys have done that. Over the past six weeks, we have collected change for a dollar three different times, all to go to uh, Mario Garcia and his church, Divino Salvador, as they minister to the Latino population in Oceano. And it is incredible, your generosity. In three weeks, you have raised $3,000. Brothers and sisters, the elders are matching that gift with money that is in our savings account. And so we are giving Mario Garcia a check for $6,000 to change the lives of families in Oceano. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that incredible? And you've done that. You're bringing restoration to our community. And so we do that in so many different ways. We minister to junior hires who are allergic to church or senior hires who are uh, who are never gonna step through, foot through these doors for young life. We minister to women who are in the process of recovery and, and restoration after so much pain and sorrow in their lives through captive hearts. Um, we help people's kitchen feeding homeless people. We partner with Mario Garcia and Davina Salvador to create learning pods for kids who don't have access to internet or to technological expertise uh, here in this community. Check out this video from Mario Garcia and listen to what he has to say about the impact that these learning prods are having on his church. Greetings, coastal community. My name is Mario Garcia. I'm the pastor of the Hispanic ministry with Grace Bible Church. And uh, I just, uh, I believe that uh, church is not necessarily a place to be. It's actually uh, that something that we want to be and uh, to be a church is to serve is to love people is to reach out to our community and that's exactly what we're doing here uh, I'm collaborating with uh, some of uh, people here and we are with your leadership and uh, this is uh, the new center that we opened for the community where the kids come and uh, uh, like at school, they, they connect to the, their computers and to their classes 
and there are people helping them and we have about approximately 12 kids uh, on Tuesday and Thursdays and uh, we're just having a great time with these kids learning here with the um, parents really um, grateful for what's going on here and you should see the kids uh, during recess during uh, break time they're interacting and it's just fun and uh, getting out of the st all this stress that they're having so I want to thank you all for what you're doing I want to uh, thank you that, that you're supporting uh, this ministry and uh, I encourage you if you uh, can be involved uh, during the, the day we are here from 8 30 to to 1 30 approximately and you can come come a couple of times and a uh, couple of hours i'm sorry and and um, interact with these kids helping them assisting them and uh, so yeah thank you for what you're doing uh, at this new center god bless you it is such a joy to join you to watch you to cheerlead by your side as you bring restoration to our community. And so that's what we believe, hope. There's hope beyond our brokenness. We get to trust in our risen Savior and that we'll, He invites us then to bring restoration to our community. And so each week, we, I ask you to say out loud what a disciple is because you're a disciple and you don't just um, uh, accidentally become a disciple. You gotta make a choice. And that choice is an everyday choice. So let's read this together. A disciple is one who walks intentionally with God, choosing to be changed by Jesus, choosing to seek Jesus first, and choosing to join Jesus in his resurrection work. And I'm so glad that you make this choice. I know you do. And I know that we feel bad when we don't. And you're here today, whatever, whatever time you're watching this, whether it's Sunday morning in your pajamas in your living room or throughout the rest of the week, you're watching this message now because you're making the choice to, to choose Jesus first, to seek him, to be changed by him and to join him. And so before we do anything else, let's pray and ask Jesus to help us because we're about to open up the last book of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, that's the book of Malachi. And he's gonna to speak directly to our hearts. And we need God, the Holy Spirit, to open our ears and open our eyes and open our hearts so that we don't just let this message bounce off of us. Because what Malachi has to say is so timely for us today. So are you ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now for this time that you would protect us, that your angels would be around us. And so we bind up and silence anything that is opposed to Jesus that might be distracting or um, preventing us from hear what you have to say. Lord, you, you're planting the seed of the gospel into our hearts through your word. And so we ask that you protect what you plant today. Grow it into a tree of life that bears fruit. Grow it. Ne prevent the enemy from, from stealing it or choking what you're doing out in our lives, God. It, protect us. And so we say yes to you today, Jesus. Speak to us through the book of Malachi. Bless my friends. Give them hope and joy as they hear your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So imagine World War II has just ended. Imagine that you're Polish and that you've just spent the last five years in Eastern Germany as a captive working in a munitions plant. And now the German Empire has ended and you're able to go home. But when you arrive in Poland, you discover that you now have a new overlord and that overlord is the Russians. And you walk around your neighborhood and your cities and your city and the city is in rubble. And so you do what everybody did after World War II, whether it was at home here in the United States or in Europe, you rebuild. You make a family, you start a business, you try and scrimp and save and survive. And what you're doing is that you're trying to recreate what life was like before the war, but the war and the exile has changed you. It's changed everybody. And so much has been lost that you're, 
It's like your entire nation has forgot what it's like to be, to be you. Well, so this is Israel after the return from Babylonian captivity. They're 70 years stuck in Iraq and Baghdad, and they come back home, and they come home in kind of waves and trickles. And their new over overlord were the Persians. That's the Iranians. Now, the Persians were unlike the Russians in this scenario that I just started with. The Persians actually wanted Israel to worship their God. It created a... Uh, a cultural stability that the Persians were after. The Persians didn't care which god that you worshipped as long as you paid your taxes to King Artaxerxes. Now the Russians, they didn't allow the Poland, Polish people this right. So in Israel, when finally the Israelis returned home, God rose up leaders to help restore what was lost in the country after 70 years of exile. And so the first people home, they, they planted their vineyards, they rebuilt their homes. And we read this in the book of Haggai and Zephaniah. That's what Haggai and Zephaniah were doing. They were the prophets that were joining the mayor Zerubbabel or the governor Zerubbabel and also the high priest Joshua. So it's your civil leader Zerubbabel, your religious leader Joshua, and then Haggai and Zephaniah are the two priests or the two prophets, excuse me, prophets. And, and they work for almost 20 years to achieve the impossible, which is to rebuild the temple. And in 516 BC, so it's near 2,500 years ago, uh, they accomplished their goal. But then things kind of get funky in a hurry. Zechariah is leaving the temple and he's literally walking, you know, 300 feet to where the sacrificial altar is. And someone in Israel who didn't want the temple to be restored um, comes up and stabs and kills Zechariah, the, the, the prophet. And Haggai goes into hiding. And then Zerubbabel dies of old age. And Joshua retires. And there's just it, like things unravel. And they don't have that combination of a great civil leader and a great high priest and two great prophets or one great prophet. They don't have that combination for 30 years. And for 30 years, what happens is that they're sort of sliding back into the old habits of captivity. Now, when you're in captivity, what do you do? You got to survive. So you make all sorts of compromises. You make all sorts of compromises to just keep your heartbeat going. Compromises about what language you speak, about what celebrations you have, about whether or not you go to church. Half the time your church is outlawed. You make compromises about who you marry, about who you allow your children to marry. About the, I mean, e e even, even your speech you make compromises on. Well, so they slid back into this old way of living. And 30 years after Ezra and, or 30 years after Zephaniah and Haggai were the prophets, a brand new um, priest comes in and his name is Nehemiah. And he's, he used to work in Iran, he's a Jew, uh, but King Artaxerxes sends him to Israel to rebuild the city walls. And so Nehemiah is there. Ezra is the high priest at the time, and he's writing his book, which is in the Old Testament, Ezra. Uh, and, and he's organizing and restarting worship again because it had been stopped. And then a brand new prophet um, shows up on the scene, and this is the prophet Malachi. Malachi would start work around 444 B.C., so this is roughly 450, 470 years before Jesus shows up on the scene. And Malachi's got tough words for the people and even tougher words for the pastor because he's trying to help these people move out of this mentality of I am a captive or to get out of the, the, the mentality that they have to make all these compromises and start living from their heart, from their true identity as God's chosen, beloved, forgiven, worthy people. And that's the message that we have today. This is the message to 
God's people from Malachi. And so the first thing that Malachi does is he says, all right, I need to address all of the people who they just feel unworthy. They, they, they feel like they're in rebellion because they are, uh, but they feel like, well, I'll never be able to make it back into God's good graces. And so uh, the first thing that Malachi does is he opens up his message to these rebels. And he says this, Malachi chapter one, verse one, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, Malachi in Hebrew just means messenger. Um, So they do believe that Malachi was an actual guy. Um, We have historical evidence of that. But you should know that like this is a message from a messenger of God, uh, almost like Malachi is an as an angel. So chapter one, verse two, I have loved you, said the Lord. But we the people say, well, how have you loved us? Now, for us rebels and even us saints, sometimes it feels like we're completely blind to God's love in our everyday life. Maybe you have a pain in your body. Like my friend's back just went out the other day. Like she just, her back went out and she felt absolutely blinded to God's love and presence. Sometimes we're having struggles in our marriage and and we can't sense God there either. Or our finances are falling apart or our children are struggling, or our past gets drugged back up, or we worry about our future. The point is this, is that the pain in our present tense often puts a veil over our eyes. Grief does this, pain does this. And it's like all we can see is what's right here. And for Israel, it was generations of people, it was literal generations of pain. It was generation after generation after generation of people in captivity, and they just forgot about God. You see, every generation needs to hear the good news of the gospel. The moment that you stop preaching the gospel to your own heart and to your own family, a predictable pattern starts. First, we stop preaching the gospel because we assume that we know it. I know about God. I know about Jesus. You know, I'm just you know, life is busy right now. I can't get to church or life is busy right now. My prayer life is kind of anemic. Oh, well. So we assume the gospel. And then what happens is that hardship comes. Hardship is always going to come. It's always going to be a part of the rhythm of our life. And our kids and our grandkids will look at us deal with this hardship. And what will they see? They will see this. Because we've assumed that we know the gospel and we're no longer preaching it to our own hearts and listening to it on a weekly basis or a daily basis, the moment that that happens, then we start responding to pain and suffering differently. We will start choosing doubt. We'll start choosing fear. We will respond by being angry or bitter towards God. Um, We'll say, well, you know what? God's not even here anymore, so whatever. And our kids and our grandkids will see that. And you'll never say the words out loud, but they'll sense it. And then when they go through hardship, you know what will happen? They won't assume the gospel anymore. They'll deny the gospel. That's what happens. And so for generation after generation, Israel didn't have anybody preaching the gospel to them. They didn't have anybody leading them in prayer. And things begin to unravel quickly. And so God says to his people, I love you. And the people says, really? It didn't feel like it. How have you loved us? Malachi chapter one, verse two, God said, God responds. Is not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And you think that's a really weird answer. What are you saying, God? Well, the language that God is using is strong for a reason. He's trying to create two extremes, right? God doesn't really hate Esau, but he's trying to show Israel something important. And that is he loves them and it's undeserved. You got to remember who Jacob is. Jacob is the deceiver. Jacob is the liar. Esau is the victim. Jacob is the younger brother who steals his the birthright and blessing from Esau's very hand. He deceives his father into into blessing him. 
And Jacob's, whose literal name means heel grabber or deceiver, Jacob would then wrestle with God at the river Jabbok as he's about to reconcile with Esau and God dislocates his hip and Jacob walks with a limp for the rest of his life and Jacob gets renamed as one who wrestles with God and the Hebrew word for one who wrestles with God is Israel. What is God saying? Israel, I love you. I know that you wrestle with me. I know that you doubt me. I know that you can't see me at times. I know that you betray and deceive other people in your life because you're desperate to get something. And you don't deserve my love. You don't deserve my grace. You don't deserve my mercy. But I give it to you anyways. God loves us, not because we're worthy of it. God loves us because that's what God does. God loves the lost. God loves the weary, the broken, the sinner. God loves you. And God starts every conversation with you, not with his disappointment, not with his frustration, not with his irritation. Never, ever, 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 ever. God starts every single conversation with you saying, I love you. Here's more grace. Here's more mercy. His mercies are renewed every morning. That's how God starts the conversation. And for us rebels, for us who we feel like we're totally unworthy of God's love, that we don't deserve to be included in any of his blessings because what has happened to us or what we've done, we need to hear this. Our hearts need to hear this before we can trust God. Now for the extra religious... For those who think they have it all together because we go to church and we're watching church online and, <sighs> yep, that's me. Those who are looking at the rebels and rolling their eyes with frustration, ugh, Matt, come on, really? Especially for us pastors. This message is for us pastors and us extra religious people. Malachi 1.6 says this, you know, a son honors his father and a servant honors his master. If then I'm a father, where's, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? Where is the awe that I demand? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? God, bring forth, God brings forth this accusation. He says, pastors, you're supposed to be one of the group who actually honors me. That's your literal job. And you're failing miserably at it. And all of us super religious, super well-behaved people say, well, how? How are we doing this? God has an answer. Verse 7, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, well, how have we polluted you? God responds this way, by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, isn't that evil? When you offer those who are lame or sick, isn't that evil? Present a blind or a lame or a sick animal to your governor. Will he accept this and show you favor? See, what's... What's God's issue with those pastors and super religious people? Yeah, we make our offering. But what are we giving? We're offering the leftovers. We're offering the scraps. We're, 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 we're tipping God rather than actually tithing. And yeah, we've technically obeyed, but really we just want to give the least amount to God that we can so that we can check off that box called obedience, expecting that God will then give us everything in return. We give him our worst. We expect that he gives us his best. What is that? That's about me wanting God's stuff, not God himself. Just yesterday morning, I was about to start my time of journaling and prayer at about 30 minutes. And I do this four or five times a week. Uh, and it's what keeps me sane. So I was about to sit down and start, but I had to look up this quick thing on my phone. I had to look up the weather 
find out what clothes I was going to wear this phone. And then, of course, the weather turned into what's it going to be like for the rest of the week and then next week. And then God interrupted me and said, Andy, read Malachi with me. I have something good for you. And so I went to my chair where I journal. I was like, okay, I'll put the phone down. So I put the phone down and I got out my Bible. And then the phone was kind of looking at me and I was looking at the phone. And so I just picked it up and just, I wanted to, the Seahawks had just won. And so I was, I just wanted to make sure like that the injury to their new safety wasn't really bad. And so I, I picked it up and I looked it on there and, and then God said a little bit louder, Andy, come read Malachi with me. I have something good for you. And you know what? passage I read <laughs> it was this one <laughs> it was the one where God said Andy why are you offering me your scraps and expecting me to give you my best and then God totally convicted me I, I'll give God the scraps of my time. I'll give him just a brief little moment. I'll say a quick prayer or I'll, I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll give ESPN.com or Amazon or um, Netflix, I'll give them my best time and attention. But to God, I will give this much time and attention. And what do I expect in return? I expect that the moment that I say a 12 second prayer, I accept, I expect God to rip open the heavens and come down in peace and power and glory and goodness and, and shape my life and take away all my problems. And if it doesn't happen in 12 seconds, I say, God, you're not enough. You're not working. This isn't how a relationship with God works because this isn't how any relationship works. I can't give all of my time to everybody except my wife and children and then demand that my wife and children give me the best of themselves or instantly meet my very need or, or take away all my pain when I talk to them for 10 seconds. And if after 10 seconds, I don't feel better than I say, it's not how it works. And what, is, what does Jesus do? He gives me all of his best. He gives me his very life. He gives me all of his time and his attention. And he gives the same to you. He's that big and that powerful and that beautiful and that good. And he never leaves us nor abandons us no matter how ridiculously immature I am. And God is asking me. God is calling me. God is asking and calling you, I love you. Come back to me. Spend quality time with me. Give me your best. You can never outgive me. I, I will give you so much more in return. Just come spend time with me. It's a heart issue. And so in Malachi chapter 2, God speaks directly to our hearts. And he's got a couple of really tough things to say. And it's message to both the rebels and the religious. First, God confronts both parties about their willingness. And he's, he's speaking first to men here. God speaks directly to men who believe that they can just marry other women um, that are worship other gods and, and worship their gods too with them without a second thought. It's just sort of like, um, yeah, come into my house and bring your pagan religion with you, and that'll be fine. But the deeper confrontation that God has is about these men's hearts and their faithfulness. Malachi 2, verse 13. This is the second thing you do. So the first thing is you marry other women and worship their gods without a second thought. Here's the second thing that you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why doesn't he? Why, do, why does God not accept my offering or my tears anymore? God's response is this, because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and wife by covenant. Well, what's going on here? Wait a minute. The wife of your youth. Wait, what's happening? You see, the issue only wasn't that men in Israel had married foreign women living in the land and then discarded God in favor of their idols. The deeper issue 
is that men in Israel were marrying foreign women and at the exact same time divorcing their Jewish wives. And so these poor women are cast aside. The divorced women are now abandoned to a life of poverty and suffering. In this honor culture, they are now forever shamed and they will not be able to remarry. Discarded, they don't have any land and therefore they don't have any inheritance. Abandoned, these women have very, very few choices about how to actually earn enough money to eat and every single one of those choices was a living nightmare. Malachi isn't pulling any punches. God, speaking to this prophet, is threatening the power of men, saying, this is evil, this is lust, and it's, he, Malachi is legitimizing the cry of these oppressed women. The God then goes for the jugular for these particular men. Verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied God? And he says this, by saying, see guys, you're the group of people who says everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. See, people back in the day, people today, equate economic su success with God's favor, right? That if I've made more money or if I have more money, then clearly God loves me, God's blessing me, all is well in my life. And what happened in that day was that men realized that they could marry the foreign, foreign women because the foreign women, they had been living in the land for the last 70 years, 150 years since the Assyrians took over. And if they just married that Assyrian woman or that Babylonian woman, then they would get their land back. And if they got their land back, then they would have steady income from farming and from, uh, you know, keeping animals and or the rent out the land to a sharecropper and, and so that they could have income, right? So it's like, no problem. I'll just divorce my Jewish wife. I'll kick her to the curb and then I'll marry this Assyrian uh, woman or this Babylonian woman. And then I have, I'm rich and, and God loves it when I'm rich because that's what God wants for me, right? Isn't that how blessing works? I get rich, which means God must approve of what I'm doing. They're calling evil good. And God says, no. This is twisted thinking. This is greed. This is faithlessness, not only to God, but also to the wives that you've just abandoned. And God says, your prayers are fake and your intentions are false. This is why in Mark chapter five, Jesus is, is literally on an ambulance, right? They got this big group of people. They're rushing him along to go heal Jairus, who's a mayor, goes heal this Jairus's daughter. And this woman has been bleeding for 12 years, reaches out and grabs Jesus as the hem of his cloak. And, and Jesus could feel the power of healing go out of him and he stops the ambulance. And here's this woman who's been alone. She's been discarded. She's been abandoned. She's been labeled as unclean. It's the same fate that the women in Malachi's time were experiencing. And, and Jesus stops and looks at her and says, your faith has healed you. Why does Jesus say this? For many reasons, but number one, it's to restore her place in the community. She hadn't been healed, not because she was faithless. She was faithfully trying to get healed for 12 years. No one could help her. They blamed her for that. And in a moment, Jesus says, it's not your problem, sweetheart. Your faith has healed you. Jesus is removing the lie that she's unworthy. Jesus is removing the burden that she's unclean. Jesus is removing the weight that she's somehow less than. Jesus is delivering her from shame and restoring her back into the community so that everybody in the community goes, whoa, it was your faith that brought healing? And at the same time, because it was her faith that made her whole, what does that do? It exposes every single person who had demeaned her and judged her and condemned her because she couldn't get healed quick enough. Can you see God's heart for the widow, the orphan, the poor, the outsider? For you who suffer, 
See, success isn't success if you make a ton of money and leave destruction in your wake. Success is when you are faithful to God and the people he's given you to love. Success is cherishing your spouse. It's cherishing your children and your grandchildren. It's creating a family where faithfulness is the richest inheritance that you give. That you would give the inheritance of repentance and and forgiveness and reconciliation and faithfulness. And I see you do this. Like I, I know that, that you understand this. I see you caring for women who have been crushed by life. You buy the girls at Captive Hearts all these incredible things and I see you delivering them to their doorstep. I see you giving generously. I see you helping our brothers and sisters who are feeling like the whole of society is, is out for them. Our black brothers and sisters, our brown brothers and sisters, you love them and you're caring for them and you're reaching out to them. And I love that. Keep going. You minister to people who are gay, who are, who are, who are struggling with mental illness, who are dealing with addiction. You're, 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 you're just ministering to everyone, young and old, rich and poor, Educated and not, it does not matter. I see you doing this and it is so beautiful. Keep on going. Keep on going. See, you're pursuing God's heart. And God's heart is that we would be the kind of people who love God and love others, especially those who are terribly wounded. Malachi then turns a corner and for all the people living in the land, they don't want to hear what Malachi have to, has to say next, but he's going to say it anyways. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Sound familiar? And the Lord whom you will seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears for he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap you've heard this before i i send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me that's literally how the gospel of mark opens up quoting malachi and you need to know that when kings and emperors visited a region, they first sent a messenger ahead of them. And that messenger um, had a huge company of soldiers. And what they would do is that they would literally clear the road. They would, you know, if a tree had fallen down, they'd saw it off because the king rode on chariots and had all this baggage and carts and whatnot. And so they would clear the road and then they would, you know, get up all the riffraff that were living on the side of the road. And the messenger would come through and say, get ready, the king is coming. Get ready, the king is coming. Pay, pay your taxes, right? Take a bath. Get ready, the king is coming. And so the king is coming. I mean, that's terrifying at this, as one part of it. And then it's so wondrous in another part because, you know, the king is coming, you know. And you could actually ask him for things or you could, he could notice you and elevate you or maybe judge you. And so what is Malachi saying? Well, when he's coming, he's going to be like a refiner's fire. So that image is pretty, pretty obvious, right? Uh, your life is going to go into the refining pit and, and the fire will burn what is uh, burnable out of your life. Ooh. Um, or like Fuller's soap, uh, that's saddle soap. If you've ever shined your own shoes, there's a product called saddle soap. It's Fuller soap. And what you do is when you put it on, um, that piece of skin, that piece of cowhide, right, or that, that animal hide, the fuller's soap or that saddle soap will literally cut and take away all the wax, all the shine, and so that you're just down to bare flesh. Is that what you want when the king comes? That all the little ways in which you... Um, put the wax on your life, that you uh, cover up with makeup, all the things that you do to clothe your nakedness and pretend that everything was all right? What if that was just washed away? What if that was just burned off you in a moment? That does not sound fun. And so God calls out those who think that they can avoid um, God, right? Oh, you, you're, giving your, you're not giving your tithe? God's going to know that. Um, 
he calls out the cheats and the sorcerers and those who traffic widows and orphans for their monetary gain. He's saying God is coming. There will be no secrets. God can see everything. You're not fooling anyone. The king is coming. You can't hide anymore. And listen to what God says will happen when he shows up. Chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble, ash. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that they will leave them neither root nor branch. Ooh. Yikes. So, so April's birthday was this last weekend. What a transition, right? And she turned 29 again. And we made pizzas uh, in this portable pizza oven that Danny and Gary Sumner let us borrow. And it was great. It was just this uh, BTU uh, lot. It's, I think it's a 30,000 BTU burner. You just got to turn on a little bit. And then uh, it's this rotating uh, you know, pizza stone that gets real hot. And it's in this little enclosed oven. So April and I put our pizza stone in there because we didn't want to mess up Danny and Gary's pizza stone. And I turned on the, this 30,000 BTU propane burner and, and I, I literally walked away to go get a utensil out of the kitchen. I came back and the pizza oven was at 450 degrees. And I was like, oh, okay, that's running a little bit hot. So I'll just turn it down a little bit here. Um, and so then I, we made a pizza and we put it in the pizza oven. It was really cool. They have these big paddles, and so you're kind of shaking and putting in the pizza with these big paddles. I felt very, very authentic. Uh, and so I thought, well, 450, that's a little bit too, you kind of want it around 600 degrees. That's the perfect kind of pizza oven temperature. And so I turned it, I turned the knob just like a furkle, right? A smidge, like a, like a quarter past a hair, right? Just itty bitty, right? And I thought, okay, that'll be good. <clears throat> and I walked back inside. I put down a utensil. I washed off one of the pizza things. I said hi to a friend. I uh, grabbed a, a drink out of the fridge for myself. I came back. It might have been 90 seconds later. And I looked inside the pizza oven. And the temperature was 900 degrees. And my pizza stone had cracked into three major pieces. And <clears throat> the pizza was this burnt hockey puck. I mean, it had gone from this big all the way down to about this big. And it was just burnt and black and it smelled absolutely awful. And I shoved the thing in and I got the pizza out. And that's what it feels like when God, you know, that's the image that Malachi is using. When God shows up, like whatever is going to remain that's good in you won't get burned away and everything else is going to look like that pizza. And I don't want, I don't want that to happen to me because it's terrifying. So what happens on the great and terrible day of the Lord? What happens on that day when, when the messenger comes and says, prepare the way? Well, we know what happens. The messenger's name is John the Baptist. It's what he says. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. Prepare the way. Make, make, strat, make straight the paths. Clear the branches, the trees. Take a bath. Repent. God, God's coming. And when Jesus shows up, what does he do? What does he do to all of us evildoers who are stuck and caught and trapped and bound up in chains? Well, he delivers us from our demons. What does he do to the widows who are bleeding and who have been abandoned and who are mourning their sons who they've just lost? Well, he raises those sons to de from death to life and he heals the women who've been bleeding and he, he welcomes them into his ragtag crew. And what does he do to the orphans? Guys like Levi, the tax collector, who didn't have a family anymore because they decided to cooperate with Rome. Well, not only does he dine with them, but then he forgives them and, and he asks them, follow me. And how does Jesus, God in the flesh, bring justice? Well, he heals the sick and he feeds the poor. And how does God in the flesh burn out the evil in my life? 
Well, he chooses to still bring that awful, horrible, terrible, bloody justice. But what Jesus does is that he chooses at the exact same time to be my substitute. And so that the justice that I deserve for the evil I've committed now falls on his shoulders. On the cross, he is my substitute. Evil is punished. There is justice for all that's been done wrong to me. There is justice that's all that's, that I've done that is wrong. And Jesus takes it all until it kills him. All so that you and I might be healed and saved and forgiven and adopted into his family. And the next verses in Malachi make me cry every time. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. The son of righteousness is spelled S-U-N, like the globe thing, burning ball of gas in the sky that keeps us alive. No one thought that that son would be the S-O-N, the son of God. That God in the flesh, Jesus, would literally rise from the dead after dying my death with healing in his wings. And what happens when you and I stand in awe? That's what this word fear means. What happens when you and I stand in fear or in awe of all of the son of righteousness with healing in his wings? What happens? For me, the rebel who has been forgiven, for me, the religious person who has been rescued, for me, who, who God has delivered and forgiven and cleansed, all because Jesus died for me. What happens when I stand in awe and in fear of this God, who the son of righteousness, who rises with healing in his wings? What happens? I, I'll dance like with joy, like a calf. Have you ever seen a calf who's been let out of their pen for the first time? They jump and they twirl and they, they, they go nuts. It's the funniest thing in all the world. I got to work at a dairy my first year of marriage and, and we let these calves go and they twirl in circles and they chase their tails and they roll them. They're like little puppy dogs, but they're a 180 pound calf twirling and jumping and flipping. And this is what you and I will do. We're saved. We're saved. We've won the cosmic lottery and the great and terrible day of the Lord when he's come hasn't led to our destruction, but our salvation. We're saved. Every single prophet that we've read wants to help you connect the dots that what you believe about God makes a difference. It makes a difference because what you do and how you treat people is always connected to what you believe about God. And you know this. You know this. How we treat the most broken of us matters. How you treat your own broken heart matters. And you have this profound purpose. You've been called, been given this incredible purpose in life to let God love you in the most tender places of your life and heart so that you can love others in the places of their deepest pain. So I have a question for you after hearing week after week after week of these minor prophets. Will you? Will you let God love you in the deepest places of your pain? so that you can be used by God to love others in the places of their great wounding. And I see you saying yes. I've watched you week after week say yes. So here's my encouragement to you. Keep going, don't stop. Keep repenting, keep learning, keep being generous. Keep on taking risks to learn the stories of those who are crying out for justice right now so that your heart might be filled with love for them. 
Our world is so weary and the world needs us to be the loving messengers that say, let's clear the obstacles so that God can get through. Let's make the path straight. Let's say God is coming and he's not coming with fire to scorch you. He's coming with love, with healing in his wings. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for filling all the prophecies of Malachi, for making right what has been made wrong. And Lord, thank you for keep on, that you'd keep on doing this work right now. So just like with Zechariah last week, where the issue was about like, are we, are we ready? Are we willing to be the kind of people to do God's work, we say yes to you once again. Lord, make us ready. Make our hearts ready. Forgive us our sins. Deliver us from evil. Open our eyes to the cries of our brothers and sisters all around us, that with compassion and love and mercy, we might be a hand of hope and help and thank you, Jesus, that you grabbed us first and you forgave us first and you always start the conversation with love. We're so grateful for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and uh, sisters, next week we're really grateful. Uh, we're going to start a sermon series on the book of Daniel. And so we'll be in Daniel all the way through the end of November and then at the, on November 29th, uh, we'll start the book of Luke, and that's the first Sunday of Advent. So only a couple more months till Christmas. What in the world? Anyways, um, if you are watching this online on Sunday morning, get your communion elements ready. So if you have some bread or some juice or whatever it is that you want to use for the bread and the wine, um, get those ready because Pastor Paul is going to be leading us in communion at the live stream at 10, 15 a.m. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance. That's his delight in you and give you the peace that passes all understanding. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, my friends. I love you very much. Have a great day.
awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Dorian.